panic, you know, that it has caused, but God has really truly been good to us. And we continue to trust him. And so we continue to bask in his divine favor and we want to really give him thanks for what he has done. Where it's not that we're better off than the others, but because of his mercies. And so tonight we're here and we celebrate him. You know, we, we praise him and we say thank you. And as we come on this forum, you know, to sort of help ourselves to, you know, keep healthy. The professionals will give us, you know, um, tips on how to keep healthy in the different areas tonight. We're expecting to have the optometrist as well as the gynecologist. So it's like a, a double uh, on the first night. And uh, I trust that, you know, the presentations will be very meaningful to us and that we will at the end be more informed on how as women uh, are generally how we can remain healthy persons. Now, um, before we do evangelist school, are you hearing me evangelist school? I am hearing you. Yes, I am going to ask you in a couple of, in another couple of minutes, we're just going to um, we're just going to do this course. I'm just going to do this course and then evangelist school. I'm going to ask you to pray. And then we're going to go into the meat of the matter. We, in another couple of minutes, then we will be having our first presenter. Uh, my uncle is an All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will say of the goodness of God. Oh, all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Oh, I will see of the goodness of God can I just ask that we open our mics if we can and we just give God thanks because he truly has been good. We have not been keeping ourselves, but he, he has. So can we just open our mics where, if we can and we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. He has brought us through 2020, a year of uncertainty. And we're in 2021. We do not know what it is, but we know that God is good. God. Hallelujah. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you. Oh, we just worship you, Lord. We just oh, bless you. In the name of Jesus. Mercy to us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we just quiet our hearts now as we ask Evangelist School to make the prayer? Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto the Lord. Our God is awesome. Our God is wonderful. We give you praise tonight, Lord. We give you thanks. Oh, God, we lift up your mighty name. Father, we adore your wonderful name. You are above all, mighty God. You are a God all by yourself. You are a, a God in a class by yourself. And Lord, we worship and we, oh God, we honor you, Lord. Tonight, we have, Father God, if we have committed any sins, mighty God, we ask for your forgiveness. Father God, we know that we have done so many things entirely here in your hands before you lord we have done 
have an error, we have complained, we have, oh God, done so many wicked things before you, Lord, but we ask that you will forgive us for our sins. And Father, as we join in tonight, mighty God, in this women's forum, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you, oh God, will be in our midst. We invite your holy presence among us, Lord. We pray, Almighty God, that whatsoever mighty God will be done and said tonight, Lord, you will get honors, oh God, you will get glory. Lord, we will not hold back any praise, oh God, from giving you, oh God, we will give you thanks, mighty God. We will add adore you. Father God, I pray, oh God, for our presenters tonight. I pray, Almighty God, for your leading and your direction. I pray, Almighty God, for their, this knowledge that you have imparted unto them, Lord, and they will be as they will be sharing it with us, Lord. I pray, Father God, that we will understand. Mighty God, I pray, Father God, for the strength of the woman's department, this evangelist read and all those that are in charge, mighty God, I pray that you, oh God, will give them the strength and the knowledge as well, Lord, so that, mighty God, another forum, mighty God, will be planning after this one. Oh, God, I pray that women all over, we will reach women all over. We will mm -hmm. reach a, a thousand women for this year and even more. More women will be motivated to praise you. More women would come to know you as Lord and Savior. More women, mm -hmm. mighty God, would go out and reach, mm -hmm. oh, God, for others, for the lost, and so tonight, I pray that you, oh God, will take charge. We leave everything entirely in your hands, Lord. And we tell you thanks in your wonderful, hallelujah, precious, mighty, magnificent name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Evangelist School. And indeed, it is our aim and our prayer that we will reach the men the length and breadth of Jamaica and uh, in other countries, in the US, in Canada, certainly it is our prayer that the Lord will truly extend our borders. And, you know, we stand on the knowledge that our God is able, not just that he's able, but he wants to make us whole. He tells us in Jeremiah 33 and verse 6, he says what? I will bring health and healing I will lead my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. So we stand on the knowledge that God wants us to be healthy. He wants us because he wants us to be able to carry his words, you know, across the length and breadth of this world. And so he wants us to remain healthy. This, this evening, our forum is special, as I said to you before. We're going to be having two presenters. It has never happened before. And so we really just praise God for what he has been doing for us. As usual, we will be having giveaways, but we also have a, a testimony. God has been good. I, 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 and so we're going to be having a testimony in between the presentations, and we'll be having our usual giveaways, phone card giveaways tonight. And I trust that so get your phones ready and so that you will be able to win uh, your, 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 your credits as we go on the journey of being, you know, healthy women. Uh, our first presenter is the optometrist. And it is, it, it is very important. And we talk about vision so much. And so it is good that we start with also maintaining, you know, our vision, being able to see our eyes is a gateway to what we do. And so we really want to be able to, to, to see properly and to function properly. And so our, our presenter, the first presenter, we're not going to delay. We're going to go right into it if we want to have a full presentation to make sure that we get our our presenter this evening is Dr. Mayana Francis. Her, 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 her mantra is that she's, a, she's determined and passionate healthcare professional and business person. And she has a genuine interest in the success of others. I can tell you this, I met her 
because she was ref I, um, somebody referred me to her practice. And when I met her, I was really, really impressed. She doesn't just act professional, but she also shows concern for the well-being of her of her patients. Now, um, she was educated at the University of the West Indies. Um, she at um, University of Guyana, where she did optometry. She has exceptional communication skills, and that is so true. She has the ability to work under pressure. She is the optometrist and diabetic. Um, she does up, she's up and diabetic retin retinopathy um, grader. She has been doing that since 2018. Uh, she's a low vision consultant. So she has a range of uh, experience and expertise when it comes to what she does. But she will speak to us about eye care. And so I I want you all just to sit back and relax. Welcome, Dr. Francis. Everybody, please just make that in this day and age. and nobody wants to be blind, am I correct? And so my life's work really is to educate persons and to prevent those persons who can be prevented from going blind, but for those that are blind to also get them the necessary help and assistance they need so that they can live an independent lifestyle. Um, one of the things I, like to go through with my patients is just the general structure of the eye so that you can get um, an indication as to what that potentially, you know, looks like. Um, I have a little diagram here. I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if we can do that. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, yes, we can. All right, yes, we can. All right, wonderful. So I'm just going to try and see if I can make this bigger by clicking this arrow. Okay, great. And, and so when we look at this diagram, it really is in two parts. So. Uh, this part of the diagram over here is what everybody sees every day, right? Which I want to liken onto a veranda, like a veranda of your house. And you can feel free to communicate with me. I like to feel like I'm speaking to people. <laughs> okay, Doc. Good. All right. So on the right side, you have the eyelid, the eyelashes and the outer part of the eye that everybody sees. And I like to say that that is the veranda of the eye. And what I mean is that when you look in the mirror, you can see it. If somebody passes by, they can see what's on the outside. However, it is difficult to know what is going on on the inside of the eye. Similarly, if you have a house, everybody can pass and look at your veranda, but they might not know what is going on on the inside of your house. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. Great. 
So we start with the, the first, the outside, and what are the things that can possibly go wrong? So if you go clear. So the part of the eye that has a color, the color is actually covered by a clear part. Now that clear part needs to stay clear so that you can see. The way that you see is by light going into the eyes. If light cannot pass through, you will not be able to see. And so that is something that you should understand. So if there is anything on the outside of the eye that is blocking the pathway of light, you will not be able to see. Similarly, if you have a house, the only way you get into the house is through the door. Yes, Am I right? <laughs> right. Because even if you try the window, grill probably is there. You can't go through the grill. <laughs> right? But if you open up the grill and the door, right by the door, then you can go through. And so if there is something that is blocking the doorway, you will not be able to go into the yes, house. Am I correct? That is the same thing. So you see this little black circle that is inside here. That's what we call the pupil. So that black circle in the middle of their eyes. Correct? Yes. So that is where we look inside of the eye. So when you visit an eye doctor, primarily what they will do, they'll shine a light through that little hole to see into this inside of the eye. So the diagram on the left now is going to show you what inside of the eye looks like. And we are looking for what we are looking on the inside of the eye. And so on before we move to the inside, on the outside, one of the things is that sometimes a little piece of flesh can grow in these areas. I'm sure you probably would have seen persons who have a little piece of flesh growing on it in these areas, on the white part of the eye going over to the yes. colored part. That is called a pterygium, right? So it's not a cataract. A lot of people think it's a cataract. It's not a cataract. It's a pterygium. And usually it's just a simple surgery to scrape it away, scrape it away so that it doesn't come and block this area. Because once this area gets blocked, your vision is going to be impacted because light can't go inside of the eye. Making sense? Yes, you are, Doc. Wonderful. So when we go now to look on the inside of the eye, we peep through this black hole here. Sometimes the hole is so small, so we put some drops to open it up big and wide. So it's easy to see. So if you're looking in the house and you're looking through a keyhole, it's going to be more difficult to see than if you just open up the door wide, correct? That's right. So that, that, is, that is what we do sometimes. Look inside. Now, the first part we look is like in the living room. Because when you look in your house, the living room is usually the first part you come yes. upon, yeah? And we look at the, the lens. So this round thing that looks like an egg right here, so middle of the eye no that is is, is kind of like a curtain yes. that yes. is in your living room so if the curtain is dark do you think a lot of light will come inside the no. house no right so this 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 lens here needs to be clear it needs to be clear so light can pass through the eye anything that disturbs the clarity is going to disturb the vision and so this lens here is like a curtain. As you get older, that curtain will get a little darker. As it gets darker, that's what we call a cataract. Oh. So the cataract is actually in the middle of the eye on the inside, right? So it's behind the black part, you know, but it's inside. So you look through to look inside to see if it has started to get dark. So back in the day, we'd say, boy, your granny eye get darker or something like that. You know, but we know that as you get older, the eye will go through some changes. And this is one of the changes where the lens will get dark. And I can compare it to a curtain that's at your window or by your doorway. So if the curtain is dark, light cannot pass through. And so again, the vision is going to be lower in a person that has a cataract. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So I'm just going through the main things 
that you probably would have heard about or the main things that are going to affect person's eyes. So there are many other things, but these are just the main things you come across in Jamaica. So as the light passes through, the light has to go to the back of the eye. So all of this here that is called the retina, it's at the back of the eye, and that is where you pick up all the signal for what you see. So when you look and you see a vase, and you look and you see a tree and all of these things, it is picked up by the retina, which is right at the back of the eye. And that signal is brought in form of light, which is why we need light to be able to pass through the, the eye and hit the right part of the retina in order to send the message via this channel here to the brain so that you can see it. All right. So persons who are diabetic, what happens is that around here, a lot of blood vessels. So we can compare this now to like the kitchen in your house. Mm -hmm. The kitchen is usually at the back. Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> so you look straight inside and the kitchen is usually at the back. And the kitchen always have one whole heap of pipe structure and fixtures underneath and stuff. Mm -hmm. so it's the same thing with the eye where it has a lot of blood vessels and just like the pipes in your house these blood vessels can leak okay so when mm -hmm. you have when you're diabetic if your diabetes is uncontrolled over a long period of time eventually it starts to damage the blood vessels and they start to leak now if the pipe in your kitchen starts to leak what is going to leak out What's Whatever. Water mm -hmm. and, and what? Whatever particles. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. So anything that is in there is going to leak out. If I pour oil down the drain, if I pour anything, that is what is going to leak out. And it's the same thing in the eye. So if your cholesterol is high, when it starts to leak, it leaks out the cholesterol. Because okay. the cholesterol is in the blood. So water is in the blood. Um, there's blood and so on. So all of these things can leak out in the back of the eye and it can get really bad and eventually lead to blindness. Okay. Right? So just and the thing I'm sure everything is all right. You, you know, you go to the doctor and say, look in my eye, look in the back of my eye. And doctor look and say, boy, the vessels look fine. The blood vessels are normal. You can go home and I see you next year. Right? So it's the same thing where you have blood vessels around here. If you have pressure, it can also damage the eye. And you know, last year, about February or March, I saw a gentleman in Lindsay and he's 27 years old and he lined because he had high blood pressure. He didn't even know. And I'm talking, he said, I just realized I can't see. Hey, what, what's been going on? You, you don't, you, you, you sure you were? He's sure. Any recent hospitalization, anything, he dropped down and then came to hospital two weeks ago. I said, why? His pressure was oh. high. He did not realize that the pressure can affect the eye. But just like the pipes in the kitchen, if your water pressure in your pipe is too high, what going to affect the pipe? It's going to burst. <laughs> it's going to burst. Same thing. Okay, your blood vessel is just like little hose, hoses. You know what I mean? Yes. The pressure is too high. So the pressure is so high that the blood vessel bursts. And when, when the pressure is high and the pipe bursts, does it leak out by seeping out or it sprays out? Sometimes it sprays, right? Oh. It's going to spray. So the same way the back of the eye look, it just spray right out all over the back of the eye. Right? So it, it really is very simple in terms of how it works because it works just like a pipe system. You just have all of these vessels and if they're not maintained and taken care of properly, then they're going to have breaks and leaks and then the body is going to try to fix it, but it's not going to work as well. And eventually the site is going to go. And in those cases, we call it diabetic retinopathy. That's for people who have diabetes or hypertensive retinopathy. That's for people who have hypertension. Now, there is a little channel that exists, right? You will see it in this diagram, it leaves the eye. And so when this, this, this channel that leaves the eye, it goes to the brain. So just like your house again, there's a back door. 
the back door, exits the kitchen, and go outside. So this channel okay, exits I'm the eye now. and go outside. I keep just like the back door. But I'm here. But I really want to show myself. I'm going to really have presentation. I'm okay. hearing you too. Can I move your mic, please? <laughs> Uh, right, so this 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 little um, channel exits and leave leaves the eye and goes outside to the brain. No, in some persons, as they get older, the channel gets damaged, and that damage is called glaucoma. Wow. So glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve, but essentially, is a channel that brings the information to the brain, and so. Any damage that happens to the nerve, we cannot turn it back. We can only stop it where it is at and try to maintain it. There's no sign and symptoms, so it's important that it gets diagnosed early. And it is very familial. So you tend to have brothers, sisters, auntie, mother, father, all of these things who have, you know, glaucoma because it runs in families a lot. Okay. So what we just did, we went through the structure of the eye in a very simple way, looking at the outside of the eye and the inside of the eye, and we looked at some common eye conditions that can affect the eye in terms of the diseases. Now, the, uh, what I want to talk about next is how you see. So when light shines in the eye it has to shine right at the exact point on the retina so that it gets a sharp image if the image is falling short then the person is nearsighted and we put a lens in front of the eye so that we can get the image falling at the right point and they can go on the mirror way wearing a glasses and seeing clearly if the image is falling too long, then we can give a different type of lens and get the image to fall on the exact point so that the person will be able to see clearly. So a person can be nearsighted, which means generally means that things that near are clearer and things that far. Generally, if a person is farsighted, things in the distance, they can't tweet the eyes and see it. But things that near gives us struggle. And then there's something else called astigmatism. Astigmatism is a little twisting of the vision. So you might see a C and think it's an O, or F and think it's a T. Or you might see well in the day, but at night you have a problem to see at night. And the, 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 the lights and stuff might give you a problem at night. So you might have astigmatism. Again, we can use glasses to correct that so that the image can fall on the right place in the back of the eye, all right? So when a person reaches age 40 though, there's another change that takes place. So just the same way changes takes place in the body, you know, you probably start getting one or two gray hair, your legs don't work as well, you're not able to um, do the things that you used to do when you're younger, the eyes also go through some changes. So one of the changes that the eye is going to go through is that the ability of the lens to expand and contract, it goes and so persons realize that they can't look at the phone, they can't read, they can't do anything, and they had perfectly fine eyes before. But by the time they reach about 40, they have to push the phone further and further away until their arm's not long enough in order to see. And then they, they say, boy, I need to know what is going on. So that condition is called presbyopia. And so at around age 40, even if you never wore glasses before and your eyes had perfect vision before, we are expecting that the normal process of aging is going to kick in. And that normal process of aging is going to cause you to need some assistance in terms of glasses to see at near. All right, so there is 
I'm going to stop screen sharing now. There is another document I want you to look at, um, which I will close out with. Well, I find you could tell me how's it going so far. Good, Doc. <laughs> Good. I hope your um, understanding has been enhanced so far. Yes, Doc. All right, let me look, looking for the document. All right, I'm going to share this one. So, I'm going to just quickly go through a vision symptom checklist. Uh, we did this uh, primarily for children. Why? Because a lot of times, or not, but they don't have their eyes. A lot of times, children know whether they're seeing or not. Because they tell Yes, they see it, but they might have looked for it. can also tell you if you've experienced any of these symptoms. So some of the symptoms that will tell you that you need an eye examination or that something might be going wrong is you might have frequent squinting of your forehead. You rub your eyes or blink a lot. Um, you might have little bumps coming up on the eyelid often. You might have problems in the light. In or out. We call that cast cast eyes. They definitely need to have an eye examination because that will predispose them to certain things. If, if a child has to hold a book very close to their eyes in order to see or or anything to do with close work, or if you see that they tend to cover one eye while reading, they have to use a finger to trace a line in the book. Or the tilting the head and misspelling or miscalling words. This parent, she almost cracked she tell in the chat. Right in not realizing that that's what the child is seeing. So the child is actually seeing the wrong thing. But it's a vision problem that the child has. Mm -hmm. So they might be murmuring or reading silently with their lips, or they might confuse similar words and little children tend to confuse D or B and those particular words sometimes. to know because they might have poor spelling skills. Um, schoolwork that depends on reading might be poor, but they might be better in math. A homework might take right. So, you know, we just have to be very observant because with children, it's a little bit more difficult because they might not be able to say or vocalize whatever they're experiencing as well as adults. And as adults, what we should do, the minute we start to experience an eye symptom, we really should just go and get our eyes checked because a lot of the time don't catch it early, you're not able to do anything about it. So we have to catch it early in order that we, we, we can do something about it if there's anything to be done. Because a lot of times you have a person who comes in and they will tell you, oh, you know, since from last year, Manasi, this lady came, she hasn't seen from the eyes for 20 years and she just reached. What? You know, some crazy things. So the minute you realize that something is not really right, especially if you have other sicknesses and illnesses, please go and get it checked. You're diabetic, hypertensive, sickle cell. And you know, one other thing is every disease you have in your body can affect your eyes. You better believe it. 
every one of them. A patient comes, any sicknesses, any medication you're taking and thing and thing. No, but when you look in the eye, you realize that this person is HIV positive. So every single thing can show up in the eyes. So everything can affect your eyes. And so you have to pay attention to just your general health and just whatever is happening to you. So if you notice something off, I mean, just, just, just take the trip, let them tell you, oh, you're a good, go home. That's better than if you take the trip years later and then somebody say, boy, you know, something happened, but we can't really help you. Or they ask you for your, your house and land and arm and leg and you don't have it to get the treatment, you know? So let us really just take care of our bodies because in taking care of our bodies inadvertently, we are taking care of our eyes and our eyesight. So you do you, anybody has any questions? All right, Doc, thank you so very much. Doc, I have a question before you go. Um, what if you feel sharp pains in your eyes when you look to a direction suddenly? What could that mean? It is often difficult to tell sometimes based on just one piece of information because all the information usually adds up. But it could be something about your muscle because in looking in a particular direction, your muscles have to turn the eye. So it's like if you're using your arm and something is wrong in one of your arm muscles, if you make a sudden turn in a certain direction, you might have a sharp pain. So it could be muscular related. Okay, thank you. Hi, good night. I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned about um, when checking children, you said something about the, um, you call it dyslexia. If mm -hmm. I suspect my own child may be having some issues, where can I go to check whether or not she's dyslexic? Well, you can go my Center. Michael Care is a place at the Michael University College next door there. It's run by the college and they actually have a whole uh, evaluation sheet that you can get your child evaluated, not just for dyslexia, but for other um, developmental or learning disorders. Um, a part of it is a visual examination as well. Do you need a referral to, to go there? No, when you go there, they will actually give you the forms and then you're going to have to take it around to the different specialists to get the child assessed based on what their thing is. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hi, Doc. Hi, Doc. Hi. Can, you, can you review back what, what is the cause of glaucoma? All right, so... Remember, I was saying that the back of the eye is like the kitchen in the house, because at the back. Yeah. And then there's a door that leaves the kitchen to go outside, right? Yes. So the same way, the nerve, the, the eye nerve, leave the eye to go outside of the eye to go to the brain. Oh. So that nerve will take all the information from seeing to the brain. Glaucoma is a condition in which there is damage to this nerve. Oh. So that pathway to the brain is getting damaged. No, the damage can be caused by an increase in the pressure in the eye. So it pressing yeah. on the nerve and increasing the pressure. Um, and a few other things can also cause it, but most times it's by an increase in the pressure in the eye. Okay. So um, it, you can have aberration in it, right? Um, you can do an operation, so if there's an increase in pressure in the eye, what they can do, they can put a hole in the eye to facilitate draining, so you know the eye is like a ball. So if the ball is sealed, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be draining, so they can actually put a hole to try to encourage draining mm -hmm. to release some of the pressure. But a lot of the mm -hmm. times here, um, the treatment is concerned with medication to reduce the pressure in the eye. Oh. Glaucoma is also very prevalent. One in 10 persons over 50 have glaucoma. One in five persons over 75 years old have glaucoma. And so 
and it's one of the leading causes of blindness world, worldwide and undoubtedly it's one of the leading causes of blindness here. But there's no early signs or symptoms. You have to catch it early through an eye examination. If somebody in your family have glaucoma, you need to make sure you get your annual eye examination where somebody looks at the back of your nerve, check your eye pressure and keep on doing that so that if anything, you can catch it early because that's the only thing about it. You have to catch it early. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Welcome. Good question. How can you, what can you do to mitigate against that in the first place? All right. So the causes of glaucoma is uncertain. We can only tell you that there are some correlations, meaning that what it is associated with. It is more prevalent in, well, <laughs> Black persons. It is, it, is, it is highly familial. So if somebody in your family has it, then it runs in families. Um, it, it is associated with an increased pressure in the eye. Um, I think those are the three main risk factors, but we really don't know what causes it. Also diabetes. So a lot of persons with diabetes actually eventually get glaucoma, but why they have not really established so they don't know what is the link between glaucoma and diabetes, except that quite a number of persons who are diabetic also have glaucoma. So we don't, we don't know. However, mm -hmm. as it relates to your health though, what I can tell I you that persons who live a more healthy lifestyle, they have better vision overall and better outcomes from vision treatment. I don't have, I don't have diabetes. You don't have to have diabetes. I'm saying that there is some correlation. So there's an association okay. between persons who have diabetes and glaucoma, right? Okay. There's an association between black persons and glaucoma. There's an association of attaining the age of 50 years old and glaucoma. There's an association between having family members with glaucoma and glaucoma. So if you are at risk, your risk is going to increase if you have family members. Your risk is going to increase once you're over 50 years old. Your risk is going to increase once you're diabetic. So as you go down and you check these things, your risk for developing glaucoma increases. But we do not know what is the exact cause of this thing. Okay. Right. No. 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 Just a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you, what's the explanation behind someone's eye consistently running water and they cannot help it? All right. So a lot of things can cause your eyes to run water. One of the main things is actually dry eyes. And that sounds funny, right? <laughs> that your eyes dry, but it's running water. So one of the main things is dry eyes because when your eye is dry, it sends a signal to the brain that the eye is dry. And then the brain now sends a signal to the tear gland to say produce more water because the eye is dry. And so it keeps producing water to try to fix the problem of the dryness. But because it is producing so much water, it doesn't have the same consistency like normal tears that would be a little bit more sticky. And so it dries out faster and the cycle continues. So dry eye is actually the number one cause of uh, watery eyes. Other things that can make the eyes watery, if a person needs glasses and they're straining the eyes, it can make the eyes watery. If there's a malfunction of the, the gland that is producing the tears that can make the eye watery, but usually that is not. The case. The most common reason is that there's some dryness in the eye for some other reason. Thanks, Doc. The reason I'm asking, I know someone who recently had a stroke, and ever since that stroke, because the face is slightly um, right. So, so again, what happened now is that the eyes dry because the lid can't close properly. So the muscles. Hmm? So it could be that the muscle in the eye is not working properly. So the eyelid can't blink to spread tears properly. And so it ends up being dry. And when it ends up being dry, then you have this tears thing going and going. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. So okay. Doc, how to address the dry eye? How do well, you? <laughs> it, it, it's difficult. And then even women who 
are menopausal tend to have dry eyes as well, but it, it is difficult. There are a lot of topical over-the-counter lubricants. What the thing about the lubricants is that they are a little oily. So that will help to keep the moisture in the eye a little bit longer, right? So some of them are a little bit more oily than others, but it, 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 it's, it's watery, it's like your tears, but just a little bit more oily to try to keep the moisture in your eyes. So most of the treatment is surrounding that. If it is the malfunction of like the muscle and all of those things, like the person with the stroke and they, they've been more than six months and that's all the improvement they're gonna get, maybe they would need some kind of surgery or something like that. Okay. Okay, Doc, one more question. Can you explain the itchiness in the eyes? You know, the eyes. Itchiness can cause okay. from dry eyes as well. Okay. So in the eyes dry can be itchy, but for the most part, it has to do with allergies. So just the same way how your nose would itch or your face would itch, then it can be that you're having a allergic reaction to different things, pollen, dust, whatever is around you, and then it makes your eyes itchy, and so you need an antihistamine, just similarly to what you take if your nose was itchy and runny. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any more questions? Doc, what's it? What's it? Um, I noticed that there are some persons who wear bifocal lens and there are some persons who don't. Is it from choice or is it that the doctor generally prescribes which one that the person well, should? Well, as I was explaining to you before, you could be nearsighted, farsighted, or astigmatism, or normal, right? Yes. So that is the first, first part. So persons who are under 40, if they need glasses, they will get glasses for nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism, which would be one lens. Yes. But even for those persons that are normal, by the time they reach 40, they realize that they can see in the distance, even with their glasses, they can see in the distance, but they cannot see at near because mm -hmm. some changes occurred in the eyes as it relates to age. So they can't see at near well. What we do know is we put in that bifocal segment so that the person can see at near. So they look through the bifocal segment to see at near and they can look through the top part to see in the distance. The thing is, nowadays, when we have so many hot, hot girls and hot boys at 40, we don't want to have any bifocal with the little line and the little part at the bottom because we're going to look like 80. <laughs> so technology has come along where we can still get a bifocal, but it doesn't have any line. So nobody can look at you and know that you're actually, in fact, it's 40 years old and not 20. <laughs> I hear you, Doc. <laughs> I have a question to ask. To ask, Doc. So, hearing, hearing. I'm hearing. Yes, I'm so, hearing. Um, um, from as young as I could remember, we have we have always my, my sister and I have always had this problem with our eyes. I'm not even sure if it's really our eyes because it's not really impacting our vision or our ability to see is more so our eyes squint or it, 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 it creates this contracting type thing and you can't really open your eyes really and it, 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 it creates this kind of nervous feeling throughout your body and it sometimes it, it, your, your eyes get a bit hot in a sense and it hurts it's like a twitching yeah right um so that is not really the eye, as you said before. Mm -hmm. It is really from the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Because, all right, we have muscles all throughout our bodies. And the thing about it is that your muscles cannot work if you don't have a nerve supply. Yeah. So all the muscles in our body have this little wire that connected to our brain, like an electrical system. Yeah. So you have like the wire that you plug into the socket and if the wire don't plug into the socket, the, 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 the TV can't turn on kind of thing. Yeah. So all our muscles have this little wire that connected to our brain. So if you want mm -hmm. to move your hand, the message mm -hmm. of 
go to from the brain to move the hand to go to the muscle to do it and back mm -hmm. along this local electrical channel right mm -hmm. same with the eye we have muscles in the eye that is responsible for opening and closing the eye yes. and these these this 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 these nerves are going to go to the brain and then a signal is going to be sent to say open and close yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so what is happening is that you're having this overstimulation and you have this signal that is going open, close, open, close or something. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. But you can clearly tell that it is also genetic because it's you and your sister. So it's in your blood, in your DNA. Yeah. Right. So it, it, is, it is really a nervous system issue. Problem. Cause, cause, <clears throat> and we have been to doctors and a lot of times they are telling us that we have stigmatism and from research realize that the symptoms under stigmatism does not really, you know. A stigmatism is a vision problem. So you yeah. can have a stigmatism as well. So that can be something separate and different from that. Yeah, because we don't have stigmatism. And I, I've been to a doctor and he said stigmatism is for old people. <laughs> or astigmat I'm sorry. <laughs> but astigmatism is for, you know. It's not for old people. Astigmatism is when you're seeing sometimes you, you mm -hmm. might see a C and think it's a O. You might see a T and think it's a F. You might have difficulty seeing at night because mm -hmm. glare is extra right okay. so you might see anything like that that can affect anybody from any age and it's very common most people have some amount of astigmatism all they need to correct that is a pair of glasses and you're on your way you could actually do have astigmatism i can't really look at you and tell you but i'd have to test you but you could have astigmatism the point is that though it is not the astigmatism that is resulting in the twitching because recommendation this this thing is it's not like I can't see I can actually see I see pro properly <laughs> I see properly. What but is your vision? My vision twenty twenty. <laughs> when was the last time you checked? Um, a few months ago. Okay. All right. Last good. Time. Yeah. What do you recommend? What do you recommend for the twitching? Or you think it's contributed by stress i am uncertain i'll be unable to say it's a nervous system problem so that is very possible um and more than likely there is actually no treatment for it okay <laughs> thank you you're welcome you're really you know, enlighten me huh you really enlighten me because um this you're thing welcome. is you know, something from I was really young and yeah, I'm an adult now. So, yeah. <laughs> you so should come you. and let me have a look at it. Okay. All right, Doc. One more thing, Doc, because um, there be no more questions. Doc, can you, because I know you practice in Linstead for those persons who are near, who are in the, near the Linstead area, but would you like to um, possibly give where your other practices are if you have? And how can you be reached? All right. So I am going to give you the offices and their phone numbers. Well, what I'll do, I'll type it in the chat. Everybody has access to the chat? Yes. I think so, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to type it in the chat. But we actually have six locations. We're in Linstead, Spanish Town, Kingston, Port Antonio, St. Thomas. Um, where am I forgetting? Mandeville. Okay, though. So I'm going to just um, go in the chat and write the, 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 the office name, the, the location, and the phone number. So you can actually call or send a WhatsApp message and somebody will respond to you. Sure. Okay, Doc. Can I ask a question? I said, do you have any time for one more? Sure, go ahead, Bishop. All right, so glaucoma, could you explain a little, I mean, what caused it, um, what, what, you know, the effects of it and so forth? I, I, I missed that part a little. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's, a long, 
You don't have to go in details, but just to say I'm what. I'm going to tell them, and I have a simple way to explain it. Ask them if you don't believe that. Explain it simple, right? Yes, dog. Yes. Don't let me know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we had likened the eye to a house. So we said that the back of the eye of the house, like the kitchen, is where all your blood vessels and the retina and so on is located. Now, just the same way you have a back door that leads outside of the house, then the eye also has a channel that leads outside the eye and goes to the brain. In glaucoma, this channel gets damaged. So that channel that leads the eye to bring information to the brain gets damaged. And this damage can be caused by an increase in the pressure in the eye. We do not know what causes glaucoma. However, there are some factors associated with glaucoma. One in 10 persons over 50 years old have glaucoma. One in five persons over 75 years old have glaucoma. Relation. So if you're over 50, your risk for glaucoma increases. If you're black, your risk for glaucoma increases. If you're diabetic, your risk for glaucoma increases. If you have family members, especially immediate family members who have glaucoma, your risk for glaucoma will particularly increase. There are no signs and symptoms usually because the damage in the eye and the vision tends to go from the, the, the ends, the side vision, the peripheral vision first. And so you probably won't notice anything, which is why it's important to get a comprehensive eye examination in order to determine if everything is okay, because you might not notice something is wrong until it is already gone. And we can't do anything to bring back the vision or bring back what is lost. We can only try to stop it from going any further. All right. Doc? Yes. Bishop, are you okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Yeah. Okay, Doc. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Doc. Yes? You're welcome. Is there time for another question? Doc, can you take one more? This is the very last one. I can. That's fine, man. I can. All Thank right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, for someone with thyroid problem, I'm not sure if this is a question for even the eye doctor, but um, I'll try. Someone with a thyroid problem, um, is there no way of stopping the eye from getting larger? Oh. Because um, normally persons with thyroid problem have one of the eye gets noticeably larger. And with me- yeah, Both I'm, of them tend to, to, get, to get larger. For me, one of them is large, a little larger than the other. You'd have a to look closer than the other. Well, right. you can't really stop it per se based on the mechanism of what is going on. Um, as I said before, every condition you have in the body can affect the eyes. Thyroid yeah. problem is particularly one of them that can cause even significant pain, injury, and um sight and vision problems in the eye um yeah. in terms of getting larger it, it goes hand in hand with the control right um from the thyroid gland so it goes hand in hand with the control so the the the, 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 the more severe it is the more likely it is that you're gonna have change in the size of the eye protruding and so on yeah, um sure. other things that you probably Experience is dryness, and that eye that is slightly larger may be drier than the other eye. It might run yeah, more I'm water. Yeah, exactly. And yes. so, and because more of that eye surface is going to be exposed now to the environment, so you might need to get some lubricants to try to right. keep your eye moist and kind of protect it um, from that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank thank you so I posted you. all the numbers so you can just look in the chat and write out the number that mm -hmm. you know, it applies to you um, mm -hmm. so that you can 
call or send a WhatsApp message. Yes, Doc. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. Very, very, very informative. I'm learning some things that I didn't even, because I never realized that um, the eye can be affected by so many of the, the, the different conditions. Thank you so very much, Doc. And uh, really, really informed. I think I'm speaking on behalf of everybody. Right about now, Doc, I'm going to ask um, Ms. Raven, please, to formalize the thank you for us. Raven, over to you. Good evening, everybody. Special good evening to you, Dr. Francis. I good just evening. want to thank you so much for coming on tonight and to share with us. It was a very informative, it was a very detailed presentation. Thank you for reminding us that we should be very careful how we go about treating our bodies because it does affect our eyes whether we like it, yes or no. So on behalf of all of us here, on behalf of the Women's Board Executive, we want to tell you thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. And we know that we'll be able to share this with our friends, with our loved ones, and with anybody else who is affected in their eyes. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you here today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed my time here. Thank you for the participation and the feedback via the questions. Thank you so much, Doc. You're welcome already. Okay, um, everybody. Can we just really just, 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 if you can open your mics and just give God some thanks for Dr. Francis. You know, there are so many things that we have learned that we never thought of, we didn't think. So can we just open our mics and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank yes. you, Lord. Yes, we really thank God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You have been so good. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank Gynecologist is going to come on in a little while from now. But before we even make contact, we, 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 there's a testimony. We know that God is good, right? Right, everybody? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes, Amen. we know that God is good. And Amen. so we have a testimony Amen. that uh, is going to, again, remind us of the goodness of God. I'm going to ask um, Sister DePaz. Are you, are you on Sister De Paz? Great. And we're going to turn over to Sister De Paz as she will give her testimony. And Sister De Paz is from Toronto Hill. Right, Sister Carleen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, everyone. Good night. Tonight is a privilege to come and to share my testimony. Well, at least one of my testimonies with, with my sisters and to use it as an encouragement to someone who may be going through some form of illness, difficulties or whatever you may be facing. So I would like to give thanks to God who is the head of my life. I wanna thank him for the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of this forum tonight to come and to impart how he has touched my life in a way that I can use it to impact other persons. The testimony I'm gonna to share tonight, I'm gonna to share of how God has brought me through what is called an ischemic stroke. Right, so in March, 2018, it was like really a normal day. I got up, I was on fasting, all of that took the day off from work. So I was going to my baby's sports day. We got to the sports day, everything was okay. Sat down on a tire, when I sat down on the tire, like I felt a little bit tired. So I had a towel and I was trying to lie down on the tire. It was hard. Persons need to mute their bikes. 
So the surface was a little bit hard. So I decided, okay, I'm not gonna lie down on the tail, I'm gonna get up. When I tried to get up, I realized that my body was not responding and I could not move. I was just there within me. I felt like I was fighting to get up, but I was not moving. Some other parents that were standing with, around, they began to assist me by putting me in a taxi. So I went from being there at the sports day, good, good celebrating with my baby, to the next thing I know, persons were putting me inside a taxi. I ended up at the Maypen Hospital. When I got there, oh my God, I was now being seen by doctors, medical personnel who were asking me questions, doing my checks, all of that. My blood pressure was not elevated. I had at no point in time was I ever diagnosed with diabetes, no high cholesterol issues. So the, the doctor was doing her checks. She asked me to move my um, right hand. I was able to lift my right hand. She said, lift your left foot. And I did so. Then she said, okay, lift your left hand. I realized my left hand was not moving any at all. She said, move your left foot. My left foot would not move. So she asked me you now to spit and I could not spit. She said, swallow. I could not. She said, okay, Miss Lepas, if you can't spit or swallow, we're going to be forced to put a tube down in your throat for you to be fed and to get whatever is coming up out of your stomach out. Oh boy, I was there. From that point, I remember they requested emergency brain scan. So um, there was no um, facilities at the Maypen Hospital for me to do that. So I was transferred now to Portmore. There's a medical complex in Portmore where my family had to pay firsthand for the, med for the examination to be done. So they were going back and forth. I had to be giving them a card number for persons to withdraw money, pay for the ambulance, pay for the um, test to be done. By this time now I'm in the emergency area waiting because there was no hospital bed for me to go on either. No ward, no accommodation on the ward. When the um, brain scan came back, I didn't have a, any blood clot. I didn't have a, um, the one that they said the blood, blood vessel burst. I didn't have that either. But I was still unable to walk. I was still unable to um, speak properly. My face was lean to the left side. I could not control my bladder. So my mother was coming. Persons were putting on diapers on me because I can't walk. I can't control the um, muscles of my bladder, stuff like that. So I spent an extended time in the hospital. My church family, my relatives, persons came, visited, prayed, and they saw me there. The testimony is long. I'm trying to um, summarize it because I know there are other persons waiting to come on after me. But I remember coming home from the hospital and my mother putting my, my diaper and my night clothes on the bed because she's going to know tidy me for me to go to my bed. But when I saw her put the pampers there, I said to her, no, I do not want it. She said, but when you want to pass your urine in the night, you're going to wet the bed. And I said, it's okay. I don't want the pampers. I'll find my way. Anyway, indeed, in the night, I felt like I wanted to use the bathroom. My daughter was beside me. I don't know how she did not wake up or realize that I was dragging myself at the end of the bed. But eventually I dragged myself to the end of the bed. I held onto the bed. I scrambled, dragging my left side. Because remember, no, my left side is like totally paralyzed. I dragged myself and I held onto the wall. It took some time and I got to the bathroom. But I got there, my urine already came down. So I, at this point now is when I called out to my daughter and she came and she came screaming, mommy, are you crazy? What if something had happened to you? What if you had fallen? I don't know where I found the strength, but I said to her, as people of God, if we say we have faith in God and God gives us the willpower to move and we do not move, what does that make our faith? It makes our faith dead. And the Bible says faith without works is dead. My sisters, that was the very last time I, I, I put a diaper on. That was the very last time I ask somebody to um, bring me to the bathroom or something like that. The doctors had said in the hospital, Mr. Paz, you would not be able to walk again until six months time. Hallelujah. When the doctor, 
when the doctor said that to me, I, I lied on there and I said to him, doctor, do you believe in God? Come on. Brethren, he did not answer. He stood there looking at me. I think he must be saying, this woman is crazy. She's here paralyzed and she's asking me about God. So he paused for a while and I said to him, the reason I asked you if you believe in God, I know when a lot of persons go to college, they change their mindset from believing in God. They start believing in science and all kind of things. And if you're standing here telling me that you do not see where I had any blood clot, I do not have hypertension, I do not have diabetes, I do not have high cholesterol. You have not found a cause as to why I have had this massive stroke that has left me paralyzed. So I need a doctor who believe in God that will put my situation before God. And at that point he looked at me and he said, yes, I believe in God. Sometimes I share with persons and say, I ask the doctor that, and they say, but Jessica, what would you have done if the doctor did not in fact believe in God? Honestly, I don't know what I would have done, but God would not have had it that I had a doctor who did not believe in him. Come on. Because if he stood there as a doctor saying, oh, I cannot understand how a young person like you with no underlying illness get this form of stroke, then I have to ask, do you believe in God? Because I want him to know that there's a greater force above what he know, what he has learned in college. And that is where I am putting my faith in to be delivered. That is where I'm putting my faith in to be healed. Shall we bless the Lord? Amen. But let me tell you something. The enemy, when the enemy comes at us, you know, he does not come at us just for one thing and he will not relent. When he sees that you're pushing, when he sees that he has come and you have held on to your faith in God, he's not going to stop. He's going to keep coming at you. He's going to keep coming at you with various things. Amen. So I came home. I basically started um, giving myself therapy. When I actually went to a physiotherapist, when she, she had two objects, one was sharp and one was soft. She said, I'm going to um, touch you with these two objects, but you have to tell me which is sharp and which is soft. Since I could not identify what she did, I could not tell her when she stick me with a pin. I could not tell her when she touched me with the paper thing that she had because my left hand had no life in it whatsoever. None at all, none at all. So now she's stringing up some electrical things on my hand. I don't even know what they are called, but she put some stuff on my hand and connect it to some electrical device to bring back the sensation in my hand. Basically, after all that they said and faith prayers from my church family, praying to God, holding on to the faith that God who delivered Job brought him through all his sickness and all his infirmities will bring me back. Though they say I would not be able to go back to work because the doctor says someone who gets a stroke like you have gotten is not eligible to go back to work. Two months and two weeks after I was back at work. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is good. Glory, glory, glory. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 That's yeah. God we God. Oh, oh, God. God. What a mighty God. Only God. Hallelujah. Yes, has to be God. Hmm. Praise hmm. God. God I be went the back to work. Oh my God, glory to God. I remember going back to work. And I, while there, I realized that I was not hearing out of my left ears. Because let me tell you, like I said before, when you the enemy realize that you have overcome one attack that he has brought onto you, he's going to come with something else. But we as people of God, we have to hold on. No matter what the enemy is bringing, we have to hold on. So I remember losing hearing in my left ear. I could not hear out of my left ear. And after that went, my voice started to become um, worse slurred. It was slurred before, but it became worse. I remember um, like when I come home and my children would try to reach out to me, they would try to show me love. It was like I was empty walking around. And I Amen. was like, my, it's not my physical body that the enemy is after. Because it Amen. was like I was not connecting with God. I was not connecting with my children. I just felt like I was basically a zombie walking around. And the Lord said to me, whenever you feel that you're going into depression, whenever you feel this way, take your prayer blanket, 
put it down and lay down on it before me. He said, if you want to cry, cry. If you want to pray, pray. If you want to read your Bible, read your Bible. But just come, lay at my feet. And I did that for like two months. I was just coming home from work, spreading out my prayer blanket and laying down before the Lord. Shall we bless the Lord? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I remember the first time. I don't know if Sister Carlene um, remember or Pastor may remember. The first time I went back to church and was to share a testimony, my daughter came up. She came up with a rug because I was drooling, but I was determined that I was not going to allow the enemy to hold me hostage. I was not going to allow him to use this thing that has come upon me to separate me from God. Yeah, hallelujah. Sis, sis, can can I ask you, sis, that we just we, 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 we see if that the rest of the testimony, because that is an awesome testimony, an awesome God in what he can do and what he will do. And it is a it is a it is a testimony to us that nothing is too hallelujah. hard. For God, come on, Hallelujah. sisters and brothers who are on the line, can we just Hallelujah. open our mouth? Can we just tell us our thanks? Hallelujah. 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 It's the name of the Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's God. Hallelujah. And we fear it. will have no dominion over her and that her temple always remain about God's goodness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, sister, sister Depas, Depas. And you keep believing God. You keep standing on the word of God because he is who he says he is. He's our healer. And he is our deliverer. Praise be to the name of the Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. We are now at the point which we still have our giveaway, so I want you to hold to be here for the end. But Evangelist Reed, you're muted. Oh Lord. I'm so sorry. Yes. So we're at the point now where we're going to be hearing from our, our, our gynecologist. Can you all hear me now? He is Dr. Yes, Clayton. Yes. Dr. Clayton Tilly. He is a consultant, obstetrician, and a gynecologist who has been practicing since 2007, where he specializes in high-risk pregnancies. Dr. Clayton studied at the University of the West Indies. He's a son of the soil in St. Catherine, Spanish town to be exact. He's married and, had, and with two children. Um, Dr. Kelly has kindly consented to speak to us um, despite his business. I, I, I think even now he's on his way from work, um, but he has kindly consented to speak to us on, on our women's forum. And so Dr. Kelly, if you, you hear me, sir, I'm handing over to you now. Thank you for consenting to speak with us. Over to you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, good night, everyone. Good night, sir. Good night. Uh, thanks thanks good for night. having me. Thanks for the invitation, Kiva. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Actually, just leaving office, um, as you mentioned, so I'm not even at home yet, um, but I mean, I'll do what I can. I'm sorry, I didn't have a presentation to really show you guys. I mean, I think it would probably be a little more enlightening if you know, I was able to demonstrate certain things, but I'll just speak off the top of my head, and if there's any questions, you guys can ask um, as, as we proceed. So tonight, right, you, I was asked to speak a little bit on uterine fibroids and endometriosis. So, you know, these are two common conditions um, in gynecology, you know, affecting our women. I mean, people are more familiar with uterine fibroids. You know, some people, Jamaica, we say fibers, 
and get a man a name, right? But um, yeah, so it's more, it's more, it's more common, commonly known, and more common than endometriosis. Endometriosis is common, however, uh, most persons will not identify themselves, or most persons would, would not have the diagnosis because of, you know, preconceptions or because of cultural norms. Um, give me, give me one minute. Let me just get out the, get out the vehicle. Amen. All right. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, yes sir. Okay, good, good, good. Hello? Yes, Doc, yes. we're here. Right, I'm back. Right, so, um, right, so a lot of persons are not familiar with endometriosis or even, they would know that they have endometriosis and that it's because of um, some preconceived ideas. I think most women would believe that, you know, to have a, have your, have your menses or your period, you should have pain, right? So having pain is one, but the pain should not be debilitating, as in it shouldn't prevent you from doing your usual activity. In your daily activity, going to work, going to school, you know, taking care of yourself, taking care of your home, and once that is a, once that's the case, then chances are um, this person might be suffering from endometriosis, and so it's quite common, but we 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 don't we, we don't see it a lot. Our people are not so familiar with it compared to the to the, to the uterine fibroids. So let's 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 look at them um, singly. Right. So, with, for uterine, for uterine fibroids, as it as it mentioned, it's a it's a growth. So it's it's not cancerous. So it's an abnormal growth on the uterus. That usually, when it's when the growth is significant, um, it manifests as you know a mass in the abdomen. Or the abdomen seems to be a little protruded, more than the usual. However, the more common symptoms is the patient usually presents with heavy menstrual bleeding. And if you're not sure what heavy bleeding is, once you're, once you're passing clots, while you're seeing a period, that would suggest that the bleed is heavy, right? You shouldn't be having, you shouldn't be having all your sanitary napkin and you're flooding, as in you're messing up your clothes unless, unless it's on for too long. So if that is the case, and then chances are you are having heavy menstrual bleeding. I mean, that, that being said, a lot of times, not because you're having heavy menstrual bleeding means that you have uterine fibroids. There's, there's a lot of other different conditions, including endometriosis, that can cause heavy menstrual bleeding. And so if, if, if you're suffering from, in, from, from that symptom, then you, the best thing is to seek, seek medical advice and, um, an intervention to find out exactly what is happening and what needs to be done. There are other symptoms of um, uterine fibroids. Also, it can have painful periods based on where the fibroids are located. So they can be located anywhere, anywhere along the uterus. They can be on the outside, in the middle, on the inside, um, and depending on where they are, they have different symptoms. So the ones on the inside of the uterus that's the lining, those are usually associated with the heavy bleeding and also will cause a lot of pain during menses. And so, and so once, once any of those symptoms are present, one need to be, one need to be, one need to consult um, a medical doctor. I'm sorry. Also, if you're, if you're having, period to the point, if you're having bleeding to the point where you start to become very tired, your, your, your eyes start to look white or your hands start to look white, suggest that you're anemic, 
means that you're losing too much blood. And that again suggests that you're having heavy bleeding and should seek, seek medical attention, right? Um, so the fiber, uterine fibers are u- usually affect women in their reproductive years, um, years so mainly in the 30s. Um, I mean, yes, it can, it can occur in younger women and it can occur, occur in older women, um, but usually we find, especially around menopause, the fibers are supposed to shrink. It's supposed to be, supposed to get less, or it's supposed to get smaller rather. Um, but if that's not the case, then again, the doctor needs to intervene and to see what's going on. One might be asking, you know, where does this fiber thing come from? Um, so it's, again, it's another mystery. We're still not fully, we still don't fully understand how it occurs or, or, or what's, what's the root cause. But we find that it's a common thing in black, in, you know, African, people of African descent, so black people like ourselves. Um, these women normally have more of a higher risk of having nutrient fibers compared to to their Caucasian counterpart. Also, you find that in families as well. So if your mother has uterine fibers, a possibility that you or your sister or your aunt might also have uterine fibers because there's some genetic connection. But we're still not sure how it come about. Um, some there's a lot of there's a lot of different different um, fads out there in terms of, you know, what dietary adjustment you can do to get rid of the fibroids. I mean, for some people it will work and for some it, it won't. And so research, res- ongoing research is that, that look into those different things. So you hear people say that they stop eating chicken because chicken will cause them to grow fibroids. That's not necessarily, that's not necessarily true, but you'll do, you do have people who have adjusted their diet and stay away from meat and they have reported, I mean, improvement in their fibroid symptoms and improvement or reduction in the size of the fibroid. But that's, that is not something that's consistently found um, through research. And so we still, we still don't have a definitive cause for it. Um, not everyone who has uterine fibroids will need surgery, right? So it depends on what is happening to them and depend on where, where at what age they are and what their desires are. Okay, um, so before I move on to endometriosis, anybody have any questions? Yes, Doc. Um, is it is it um is it well true or false? Is it that um if you do not um fibroids can cause if you don't remove them or you don't pay attention to them you can it can cause cancer no so it, it doesn't translate to cancer okay it doesn't but you have you have other cancers that resembles um uterine fiber and so so as I, as i mentioned if you have somebody who has stopped seeing period so they're menopausal yes and they start they have a, a mass in their uterus that keeps mm-hmm. on growing or it's not shrinking, then we usually wonder if, you know, whatever is going on is, is cancerous. Okay. But it's not, it's not a case where you have uterine fibers and if you don't take it out, it's gonna become cancerous. No, that's not true. Okay. Now. One question. Is the fibroids um, like a sock? And if it's a sock, can, can, um, can the sock be like, like it bursts and then the fluid runs out? So it's not like a sack. It's like, all right, imagine, so imagine it's like muscle. Mm-hmm. So you see, you look on a chicken breast, and it just mm-hmm. seems like, seem like a lot of, a thread of, a, a conglomerate of, a thread of, 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 of meat. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's a sort of texture as it is, but it's usually whiter. It's mm-hmm. whiter, right? The problem though is when it, it, it grows because it gets blood, it gets blood from, from, from your uterus. So your uterus provides it with, just like in a baby growing in there, the baby grows because the baby's being fed by your blood. So it gets blood from you, as well as the hormones that you produce. And that's why when you have, when you have somebody who has fibroids in pregnancy, 
the fibroids typically grows with the pregnancy okay. because it is being fed by, by the blood supply and the hormones. However, when they get really big, they can reach the point where your body is unable to provide it with enough blood. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, it, any part of your body start to receive blood, it starts to break down. So that same fiber can actually start break down and in breaking down, it, 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 it forms, it basically becomes liquid or liquefied. Mm -hmm. And that in itself can actually, is usually very painful. The process, when it starts to break down or we call it degenerate, Okay. It's a really painful process, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really like burst and leak out because it's within the uterus itself. Okay. Okay. okay thanks. Mm. Any more questions, ladies, on fibroids? All right. So let's move to endometriosis. Right, so I mean, having a diagram would be good for to explain this one, but all right, let me try try simplify it. So, all right, so normally when you see your period on a monthly basis, you bleed because the lining of your uterus or the lining of your womb has grown to a to a stage, and then when the body decides decides to remove certain hormone, that lining sheds. And when it sheds, it causes bleeding and you have your menstrual, your monthly menstrual, okay? So that, that very same lining, the cells that line the uterus that grows and then, and then sheds can also be found in different parts of the body. Um, when it is found in different parts of the body, it is, it is referred to as endometriosis. It's referred to as endometriosis is most commonly found, most commonly found in the pelvis in areas beside the womb. And so what, as you can imagine, it is going to respond just the same like the cells that are within the line of the womb. So when those cells bleed, the cells that are other places in the body will also bleed and so when you're bleeding on the outside and you're seeing blood coming through the vagina, there's also blood, there's also bleeding in the, in the pelvis or belly, easier to understand, bleeding that occurs there as well. And that's why for some people, when they see the period, it is so painful because anytime you have blood within the belly, it, blood is an irritant. And it, and it can be quite painful. And so you have some persons who see their period and they, and they literally, literally cannot do anything else but remain, in, remain at home in another mm -hmm. pain. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is endometriosis. In very, in very, very infrequent times, that, that very cell can be in other places. So like it can be in your lungs, mm -hmm. It can be in your brain. It can be in your spinal cord. Um, these things are very infrequent. I've seen a couple of them. But as you can imagine, it can be very serious. So persons who have end of, end, um, those cells in their brain, they'll actually have stroke on a monthly basis. So when they see the period, actually bleeding in their brain as well. Same way with, with those with, 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 with the deposit in their lung, they'll actually bleed in their lung and so they, be, they have shortness of breath and they're coughing up blood when they're having their period on a monthly basis. <laughs> so these, these persons, as you can imagine, are usually very, um, very ill around that time and there's very little that they can do about it. Really? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it can be very serious, but for the, for the, for the most part, it's usually confined to the pelvis and the, and the, the, the tummy area. Right. Um, so work work commonly again. We still not we still not sure what happened. I mean, how how, how it come about. So a lot of theories that 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 is formulated. Um, you know, persons. The suggestion is that you know when people start seeing a period, some of the time 
you have some of the cells, instead of going out, they kind of wash back, like a backflow, and, it, and the backflow passes the cells into the belly and causes deposits. Um, so yeah, a lot of theories, still, still nothing um, proven concretely. And so um, they pretty much we just treat, treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it, it's again another disease of reproductive of reproductive age group, so it will not affect will not really affect a person who's who's in their who's a, who's, who's menopausal, because of course they would have stopped seeing their period because the, the, the cells respond to the female hormone and the estrogen and progesterone those hormones that are released from the ovary. Uh, you know, once you reach the menopause, the ovaries really don't function. And so it don't really affect um, older women. Also, um, younger women, not so much, um, but yes, it can happen. But mainly women in their reproductive um, age group. Um, so yes, yeah, so as I said, the, the most common symptoms is pain. So painful period, heavy period. Um, it can also, in, in severe forms, it can also affect your affect fertility. So because of the bleeding, remember just like on the outside, when you when you if you get a cut on it and it and it and you bleed, after a while the blood as we would say clog up, the blood yeah. start to contract. And so if that same blood on the inside will start to contract and it start to pull the tissues together. And so mm -hmm. if you have bleeding around, like say if bleeding around your, your tubes, your fallopian tubes, it will actually cause, cause the tubes to be blocked. It can also affect your ovaries as well. Um, you can have cysts in the ovaries that, that has a lot of blood in them from the same cells that are bleeding every month. And so it can affect, affect you having, having um, children in the future because of um, the complications. Or the result of the blood being in the in the pelvis, um, and again for endometriosis, in especially when it forms those big cysts, we call them chocolate cysts because they're they're filled with um, old blood. That you know, after a while, blood, blood when the blood is old, it moves from red to to a brownish color. So we call it chocolate cysts. So those cysts after. If if they if they reach a certain size, and 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 remain for for a long extended period, it can result in ovarian cancer, and so it's something that we have to, you know, we have we have we have to look out for those things, and and um, ultrasound will help us with making those diagnoses. All right, so those are the common symptoms with with um with endometriosis. Um, usually we don't necessarily need to. I mean, usually when we make the diagnosis based on what the patient tells us, but for some people, we might need to do surgery to help with the diagnosis and also to help with the treatment. Because mm -hmm. what happens, though, those very deposits, when you, when you go inside the belly, you can actually, you can actually see because it has a distinct appearance. And what, what we do sometimes, we try to strip away the deposits and try to clear them as much as possible so that the person can have um, a more, you know, less painful, painful cycle. And um, if there's any tissue or any organ that has been trapped in those, in the, in, in the, in the old blood that has, that, has, that has been formed in there, we try to release those as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's surgery. I would try, as I said, we only do surgery if it's absolutely necessary because again, surgery in itself has its risk and it, the surgery itself can actually cause the, the deposits or the cells to be to be to be to be moved to other places. So, like I've seen persons who who had a who have a who had a C-section or who, who have had a laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgeries when you have the tiny holes in the tummy and they pass the, 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 the telescope in there. I've seen persons who come back with endometrial endometrial deposits. In those scar tissue, so similar thing. So when they when they bleed on a monthly basis, they actually start bleed in the scar tissue or in where the where the incision was made. And so we only do surgery if it's absolutely necessary. 
Um, so yes, there is treatment, but the treatment is usually symptomatic. Um, so unlike fibroids where you can cut out the fibroid, and um, again, I didn't mention that, but you can do surgery for the fibroid and remove it, right? Um, but again, you know, usually inform the patient that taking out the fibroids, you have a 50% chance that they'll grow back. So half of the woman, half of the woman who you operate, who you operate on and remove the fibroids, they will continue on their merry way without any other issue. But then you have the other half where the fibroid actually regrow and the problem return. So with endometriosis, you can remove every single deposits because of course, you know, you're gonna have microscopic cells that you can identify with your naked eye. And so you can really like fully remove every single deposits. And so the pay, even with the surgery, patient might still have symptoms um so yes yeah, so 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 other so other methods that we use apart from surgery so there's medication medication that actually sort of block some of those hormones that you ovaries produce that will stimulate the menses so we basically try to manipulate manipulate the donor the, the entire the whole hormonal um system so of course, you know, might might, might basically stop you stop your stop your cycle for a while to try and dry up those deposits elsewhere in the body. Um, right. So from you know from oral contraceptive pills to to injections to implants, you know, those are different um, medications that we use um, to help with the system and of with the, with this with the symptom. And of course, um, pain medication. So the usual, you know, Panadol, Panadine, you might be familiar with Voltaren, um, some of those um, non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory medications to help um, abate the pain that the patient um, endure on a monthly basis. And for some people, the pain continues throughout. It's just that it's worse when they see the period. You know, some people tell you that they have pain pretty much every day. Um, it's just that when they're having a period, the pain is worse. So it can be a really debil debilitating diagnosis um, and very frustrating for both patient and doctor um, to, to deal with. And I think part of it, part of it is because we're still we're still learning, you know, about about the disease process. Um, yeah. Any any questions? Yes, doc. Good evening, Dr. Kelly. I have Even known of persons who continued <clears throat> to spot from one cycle to the other. What would cause that? Right, so spotting can, so spotting can be caused by a, a myriad of things. And so, you, you know, when you come to the doctor, doctor, you, you see the doctor ask you a lot of questions. And then after the doctor asks you questions, then he'll examine you. Because, I mean, spotting can be, can range from an infection. So you could have an infection somewhere in the vagina, mm -hmm. cervix. Uh, from an infection to a polyp, you can have a polyp on the cervix, a polyp on the on the line of the womb. It can actually have fibroids as well. It can have fibroids on the cervix. It can have fibroids on the line of the womb, as I mentioned. Um, it can also have it can also have um, hormonal hormonal issues. So some people whose whose hormone hormone we hear people talk about hormone imbalance. You know, people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, those people can actually have spotting because their hormonal hormonal system is kind of out of, out of control. So, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a myriad of things can, can, can result in that, but then, you know, you need somebody to properly take a history and, and do a, a proper examination. And then you might, after that, you might very well need to do other things like ultrasound, you know, just to see if there's anything that you're unable to detect with looking and feeling. Well, Doc. Yes, dear. Um, for, for how soon do you recommend that women do hysterectomy? You mentioned that um, there are times when the fibroid um, comes back. Mm -hmm. And so because, I don't know, there's this popular thing that if you do it too early, you can it can lead to you getting cancer. I'm not sure if that's you true. Doing the, doing the hysterectomy? Doing the doing the hysterectomy too early. Uh -huh. How early can one do the hysterectomy? All right. 
So during the hysterectomy, um, so a lot of things need to be considered as well. All right. So clearly it has to be somebody who, who have, you know, probably fulfilled their fertility desire, meaning that they have had their kids and they decided they don't want any more. All right. So, I mean, so if somebody who plan to have more kids cannot have a hysterectomy, right? Okay. Because then you need a womb. Right, so you need to you need to be be there, and then of course the symptoms that you're having are not controlled by medication. So if yeah. that's if if that, if that's the case, then yes. Um, so hysterectomy in itself, um, there is you can you can do an hysterectomy and not trouble your ovaries, right? Meaning that you you'd still have you still have your 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 hormone being produced. So even though you're not seeing your period on a monthly basis you'll still have, you're, you're still not going to menopause. Okay. And so, so women who are older than, older than, older than 45 or even older than 50, who have to have a hysterectomy done, we usually leave the ovaries behind so that they won't go into menopause early. Understand, so how early depends on, on what's happening to the patient, as yeah. in what symptoms she's having, and if the symptoms are not being held by medication, mm -hmm. and if the patient has no desire to have kids, okay. In terms of in terms of doing hysterectomy and it cause, causing cancer, mm -hmm. no. So usually, usually what happens if so? In addition to in addition to taking out the womb, right? The womb is con the womb the the, the tubes, the fallopian tubes are connected to the womb. So sometimes, yeah. depending on what's happening, doctor might not be able to remove everything or he decides to leave the, 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 the tubes behind. But the tube itself, the tube itself, um, when you leave it behind, that increases the chance of, of you developing ovarian cancer. But okay. the thought that the cancer actually comes from the tube Mm -hmm. But usually when you do hysterectomy, the tubes are tubes are usually removed as well. Okay. So doing hysterectomy don't necessarily increases your risk of having um, cancer. Yes. Understand? Yes, doc. Yes. It's just that if you if you have to take out the, the ovary as well, you'd go into menopause. Yes. And then of course, when you go into menopause, when you go into menopause before the usual time. Yes. The menopausal symptoms are usually quite severe because it's it's instantaneous. Yes. For instance, if you do surgery and take out your ovaries and your uterus today, the symptoms symptoms can hit you as early as tomorrow, and the symptoms are usually very severe compared to somebody who who slowly goes into the menopause naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, doc. Thank. You. One more question, doc. Um, in terms of the Estrogen, what happens to the production of estrogen after you have had um, the hysterectomy? So the, so the estrogen, estrogen um, production still comes from the ovary, if it is still there. Yes. But if you remove the ovary, then you won't be producing the usual amount of estrogen. Yes. Right, so of course, and that's, so that's why things will start to change. And, and you see that in the menopause on females. So you, the hair, your hair gets thin. Your skin is not as soft and subtle as, subtle as before. Um, you get irritated. Your bone is not as strong as before. Um, the vagina gets dry. Um, yeah. Okay. Right, but 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 the most most of the estrogen is is produced, or the most active form of estrogen is produced from your ovary. Mm -hmm. so you get some amount of estrogen produced from the from the liver, and and in the skin, but those are usually very minimal. Okay. So once you remove the ovary, then you you essentially go into menopause, and that's mainly because of the estrogen production. Is there anything that can assist um, with that? Right. So usually, so for, for women who, for women who are who are who are premenopausal, so women who were still having their period before you put them into menopause, usually put them on medication to kind of 
to prevent them from going from going head on into menopause into menopause. So we give them um, combination combination hormones, so estrogen and progesterone, and um, so it's pretty much similar similar OCPs that a, a regular patient would take to prevent pregnancy, but in probably different different quantity or different amounts of the hormones. Okay. So we usually put them on those medications to prevent that from happening. Okay. Okay, Doc, thanks. Any more questions, ladies? Yes, there are some questions in the chat. Oh, let me see. Uh, there's a first one, Doc. He says, do tampons cause cancer or any type of infection or harm to our bodies? No. So... Tampons, if if of course you know that if it shouldn't be left there for any period of time, because if it if it's left for long, then you develop infection and you can actually have a severe form of infection. We actually go into 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 a toxic shock, and so so the tampon should be changed as prescribed. Okay. Uh, but in terms of cancer, no. Thanks, Doc. There's a second one as well. It's. Um, it says, is there anything that can be done to prevent the pains associated with your cycle or is there anything that you can do to remove it? Reduce. And then the same person asks a second question, is it safe to remove your wound? All right, so let me start from the last one first. So is it safe to remove your wound? Um, only if it's necessary, because removing a wound is a surgical procedure and all surgeries carries risk. So yeah, every surgery has its risk. So that should only be done if it's absolutely necessary. All right, so the second question says, is there anything that could be done to prevent pain? Yes, so I mean, so easy, easy fix to that is to stop your period altogether, right? And that will reduce most pain, however, some people who have endometriosis, even when you stop the stop the stop the period, when they stop the period, they still may complain. It might be less, but they still might complain of pain. Because what you find with these women who have been having there, some of them have been having pain from the from the start seeing period. So there's there become a psychological component to it. Mm -hmm. And so you find that even with medication, a lot of these women will have very little um, benefit. And so now then you might have to involve a psychological component to, to treatment um, in terms of how to deal with the pain and getting, getting it might, might need to even get the psychologist involved um, because some of the times um, these pains are associated with some sort of trauma. So whether it's you know uh, an abuse or you know some sexual assault or something, and so you find that just the medication alone might not work. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Any more questions, ladies? May I have ask a question, but it doesn't have anything to do with injury, endometriosis, or fibroids. Can I? Go ahead. Yeah. Let me, you want me to answer this? There's a lot. There's another question in the chat before you go to that. Somebody's asking, so they're seeing their menstrual twice per month. What is happening? So you can actually see a period twice a month, depending on the length of your cycle. So for instance, a cycle, a cycle length can be as, as small as 21 days, and it can be as much as 35 days. So if you have, if you have, for instance, a 21 day cycle, you can see where you, you might actually, so if you have a 21 day cycle and you start a period on the 1st of January, all right, the cycle is gonna end on the 21st. So you're actually gonna have a period again on the 21st. However, this should not be happening every month. You understand? It should not, it should not be happening every month, um, but you can have a period at, Two, two times in a month if you have a short cycle and that is quite normal. Okay. Um, your question. HPV, is it cancerous? 
So yeah, it's a virus, human papilloma virus. Um, it is one of the most common sexually transmitted viruses worldwide, and it can cause a number of cancers. So in females, it can cause cervical cancer, vaginal cancer. It can cause cancer of the of the throat. It can cause cancer of the entire GI tract. And for men, it can cause also cancer of the of the penis. So yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Any more questions? Yes, there's one more question in the chat doc and someone is asking, is it natural for you to have back pain while you are on your monthly cycle? Right, so you, as I said, you, you, you might have some other pain, but it should not be anything debilitating. Okay. Yeah, it shouldn't be debilitating to the point where you can't, you, you, you cannot function. That is abnormal. All righty. Are there any more questions? Any more questions? All right, Doc. Thank you so very much, Doctor. It has been really informative. I had no idea that um, the endometriosis could be formed, you, that lining could be any or it should be. Yeah. Um, Yes, doc. And, and, and then the other thing though, doc, for those persons, that abnormal type, how do they get help? How do you doctors help them? Because I, I hear you mentioning that it is, um, this happens like regularly every time the month happens, it happens as well. So what do, how do you help those people? Which, which set of people you're talking? You are. You said that persons have the bleeding in the lungs sometimes. Right, right. And in the brain. Mm -hmm. how, how do you? How do you? Doctors help persons who are in that situation. So usually, usually, pretty much, we try to shut down their their period. Okay. But this is not something that you can do for life lifelong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, because you can't really, you can't really cut out the lungs. Like when you cut out the womb, you can't really cut out the lungs. Right, right. right. Cut out the brain. So we usually try them with um, with the high dose um, hormonal treatment to kind of shut down. Um, but even with this, sometimes it really doesn't help. I mean, and the, the, the patient that I, I know of that had it in the brain, she died in her thirties. Oh Lord. Yeah, it, it's, it's not easy to treat. Yeah. Oh, ah. Thank you so very much, Doc. Um, really, really informative. And um, I'm sure that we ladies are those persons who are on, even if it's a husband, you know, we are just that much more informed about right. the, the, these, these things and we will know. Doctor, your practice. Right. Good night, Shaka so, Paul. Hmm? Hello? 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 Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, right. So I am located at Angels, um, Angels Spanish Town. That's the only, the only medical center in the plaza, um, Angels yeah. Healthcare. So I am there on uh, Monday at 4. Um, I'll type the number at the end of the presentation um, so you guys can see. I'm also, I'm also in, in half a tree at York Medical on a Thursday, and I'm in Portmore on a, on a Wednesday, Wednesday. So I'm, I'm gonna also send my card um, to Kiva and she can share it with you guys. Yes, doc. As well. Yes, doc. All right, doc. So doc, we want to thank you so very much for the presentation, very, very informative, as I said before, and we leave here really that much more knowledgeable and we know when to move, when we feel certain things, certain types of pain, we will know exactly, you know, what we are to do. I'm going to turn over to um, Sister Carleen, who's going to formalize the thank you. 
Yeah, over so before, sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you, but before you go ahead, just to remind, remind the ladies, um, this being um, cervical cancer month, it's important that you get your pap smear done. Ladies, very important. Um, I know a lot of people will say it's, it's painful, it's, it's, it's unbearable, but I mean, that's not true. I know, I know Kiva can testify <laughs> to, to not having it, that, that experience. But, but just think of it this way. I mean, a few minutes of, of, of discomfort compared to a lifetime of, of trauma, you know, suffering from a, from a, from a cancer that, that could be prevented. Yes. Um, you just go and get your pap smear done. It doesn't take much time and it's not expensive. Yes. All right? Yeah, yes. man, God bless you. Thank you, Doc. Over to you, Sister Carleen. Wow, Dr. Kelly, we want to thank you so much for making yourself available to share with us tonight. Truly, we learned a whole lot. And the session was very interactive and really informative. And as you mentioned that you're in Angels, I remember hearing about you. So you are indeed a very good doctor. We were reminded to take our health seriously. And if we're having medical issues, we should visit our practitioner. We should also do our yearly checkup and maintain a healthy diet and a lifestyle. On behalf of our ladies ministry, we want to thank you so much, Doc, for sharing with us tonight. We truly thank you and God bless you. Yeah. yeah man. It was a pleasure. And thanks again for the invite. Thank you so much, Doc. Bless you. All right, blessings. Take care. All right, ladies. Certainly, um, it has been a night that is really filled with information as regards our health. We heard from the optician. We heard from the, the gynecologist. And uh, we had that powerful testimony. I am, I, um, Sister DePaz is still here. And we would really want to give her another five minutes just to just to complete her testimony. Sister De Paz, are you still here? Are you still here, Sister De Paz? In the meantime, um, I'm going to ask you ladies to get your, your, your phones out. Um, Sister Raven, this time I'm just going to ask you. We're not even going to be asking questions per se. I'm just going to ask you to get your phones out. There are two sets of cards. There are two um, Digicel cards and there are two uh, Lime cards. I'm just going to get you, ask you to get your phones out. We're going to just test how swift you are. If, <laughs> so Raven is going to, be, it's going to be dealing with that. In the meantime, Sister De Paz, are you still here? Yes, Sister, I'm still here. Right. So I'm going to ask you know, an, another five minutes to just continue with that powerful testimony of how God has delivered you. Please continue, sis. Thank you very much, sis. So now I'm at the point where I was sent home from the hospital on aspirin, right? Because since I found nothing wrong with me, they sent me home on aspirin and um, cholesterol tablets. I asked the doctor, I do not have high cholesterol. Why am I taking this? Oh, it's standard procedure for persons who have a stroke. I remember going to the pharmacy to fill my prescription and the pharmacist said, oh, I cannot refill this prescription. It's expired. The prescription is for three refills and you have gotten them because you were in the hospital in January. I said, no, 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 I wasn't in the hospital in January. I was in the hospital in March. She said, well, based on the date that's on the prescription, I cannot refill this prescription. You have to go back to the hospital. So I took it back to the hospital where um, the nurses there found out that instead of getting what they call baby aspirins, I'm not even sure what milligram those should be. 80 something, I think they said it should have been. I was placed on um, aspirins that are 325 milligrams. The doctors on the ward would not rewrite a prescription for the medication because they're saying, oh, you didn't have a blood clot. You should not even be on these. Why are you taking them? Wow. The doctor who wrote them was not there. So I was sent away without medication. Oh my goodness. Nothing at all. So I had to come back home on fate. 
prayer and just trusting God to heal me. It was a long journey. Trust me, I basically just broke it up in bits and pieces because at one point I lost my taste. I made breakfast, went to church, and when I came back, my taste was gone. There wow. were so many afflictions that the enemy brought upon me through this stroke. But I said, Lord, let this that has come upon me, let it be for your glory. Let it be for your honor. Let when persons see me, they know that it is the hand of God that has brought me through. Because without medication, sis, trust me, without any form of medication, if I meet you in person today and I do not tell you that I had a stroke that left me paralyzed on one side, sis, you would not know that I had gone through all of that. You would not know that at one point my face was lean. I could not speak properly. I was drooling. I was at work and I was drooling. They say, oh, your brain has basically gone back to the stage of a baby. You have to teach yourself everything. I could not bathe myself, could not tie my shoes, lace, could not button my clothes. I couldn't do nothing at all for myself. But today I stand because of the grace of God, because of his healing touch, because of his mercy, because of his blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. I stand today healed, completely healed. My bishop and sister Caroline can tell you that if you see Sister the past now and you saw her when she was in the hospital, you would not believe. Well, we would believe, of course, because we trust in God and we know who he is. Amen. But for persons who do not know him, if they see me now and saw me then, I remember going to work and my staff, one of my staff basically cried when she saw me walk through the door because they came to visit. They saw me there on the bed in dark purse, unable to move and everything. And when I walked through the office door, everybody was amazed. And today I stand, I own no, I give no thanks to the doctors. I give no thanks to man. I give all the thanks, all the praise and all the glory to God. It's because of him where I can come on tonight and confidently testify because my speech was slurred. I was so um, insecure. I was so inconfident. I was lacking everything. I was just having low self-esteem and everything. I doubted myself. I kept saying, oh, I sound so bad. I look so bad. But sometimes the Lord would remind me, you know how many persons have a stroke and have not lived to tell the tales of it. That's you're complaining right. that your face is lean or your speech is slurred, but you are here. You are here to stand and to give God thanks. Hallelujah. And sometimes I would have to repent when I find myself thinking about these things. I would have to stop in the midst of it and say, Lord, I repent because I remember when I was on the hospital bed and I had to use my right hand to lift up my left hand and I said, Lord, these hands were made to serve you. These feet were made to walk and to do your work. This voice was made to glorify you. And if I'm in a hospital crippled, then I'm of no use to you. Come but on. you know, sis, it's amazing. I was saying that and in the middle of that, the Lord had me ministering to the ladies on the female medical ward of Maypen Hospital. I was telling them about the situation of Job when he was afflicted. And how God brought him through and how God restored yeah. him greater than he was before. Hallelujah. And I just want to encourage somebody on here through my testimony that do, it does not matter what you're going through. It may be physical sickness. Doctor may not be able to find what is wrong with you. But we serve a God who is still in the healing business. Yeah. The Bible tells us that by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. I could not have done it by myself if doctors who are well learned and know about science and medicine could not have done it. I could have done nothing of myself to restore myself. But today I stand to declare that it is God's grace and mercy that have kept me and has carried me through. And I just want to encourage somebody to hold on and put their faith and their confidence in God because he will not disappoint them. Thank you, Jesus. God Hallelujah. bless you and thank Hallelujah. you for us. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Listen, Hallelujah. lady. Listen. Hallelujah. This is, this is something that we need to celebrate, God. Hallelujah. We need to really celebrate Him Lord and give us praise, Lord. To His name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Awesome God. How great thou art. Thank you, Jesus. You are great. And mighty are your miracles. We stand in awe 
at your holy name lord we bow and worship you those who can join in awesome god how great thou art you are great and mighty are your miracles we stand in awe at your holy name lord we bow and worship you Come on, can we spend a couple more moments just to tell him how awesome he is? Indeed, he is the good God. Hallelujah. And we lift our praises to him tonight for his miraculous work in our lives, in the life of our sister. Hallelujah. God, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sister Robin, I'm going to turn over to you. I'm going to ask you, Just we're just going to do it like sorting on. You pick up your phone and she gives the numbers and if and you and you get it. All right, sisters. Thank over you to you, much. Sister Robin. Is it digital or live? She will tell you which one. There are two digital ones and two lime ones. And each, each is worth... Uh, what is it again, Raven? Two hundred dollars. The lime ones, Raven, are what? One hundred dollars. Right. So it's going to be a little bit tricky. I'm going to be giving away the digital first. So this is for all the DG networkers it's going in the chat. So just really, who services the quickest? And let us know when you have received it. And it's going now. Oh. Digital. Yeah, those with Digicel, it's in the chat. This is the first one for DG. Sorry, baby, we never realized. Come now, let me take it off. Anybody got it? Did anybody get that one? No. No, I don't even know how to put on credit. Well, for the digital, it's star one, two, one, star. Yes, for, for, yes, for digital, star one, two, one, star. And you put the number on and then the number sign at the end. Has anybody got it? Not yet. Really? Is it that nobody's on with a digital phone? Or maybe they're prepaid. It's used already. Well, somebody got it. Number. That means somebody got it. Can we say who got it? I can I hear the number? It's used. No, the number is, is typed in the chat. Right, so somebody got Wait, it. If somebody, somebody got it. Right. All right, Reverend, so move to the next. All right, so we're going to be actually sending two lime because that's how we got them. We got them in hundreds. So this is the first batch of lime. All right. Let's By the way, Reverend, is it the same star one to one for the lime as well? Yes. Yes, man, it is. So this is for the lime. So if you're good enough to get both of them, or two persons can get a hundred dollars each. Oh, Jesus. The first lime so got it. Congratulations. 
All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. Where do we go next, Reven? The one has been claimed, the other, the other hasn't been claimed. Oh, the first one was claimed. Okay. It was used though, because I tried and it's it, somebody has used it because um somebody else has tried and it is used up. All right, no problem. So we're going to I the... think I know who get it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Tori. Yeah, I think I know who got that one. All right. Congrats on you, Tori. All right, so for the second <laughs> DG. <laughs> for the second DG, we're gonna call this one out. So for all the DG person, get your phones ready. Star one, two, one, star. And we go four, three, seven, eight, six, seven, two, seven, nine, five, one, nine, four, number sign, send. Did anybody get that one? It says this water is used already. Which means somebody got it, Sister Carlene. <laughs> Will the person who got it indicate, please? So that we know for sure. All right, so we're going to go to the final two. That's, it, that's, the, that's for the lime now, the final two. Right, so we're going to the first 100. Star one, two, one, star. And we go five, one, four, four, five, zero, seven, three, five, four, nine, eight, eight, nine. <clears throat> Sister, the past, did you get it? I hear it. Like a... <laughs> no, sister, keep saying that they're um, invalid. Because I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, um, Bishop. Bishop. So the, the final one, Sister Raven. Final line. Let's go again. Star one, two, one. Star number sign. Triple zero. One, six, seven. Five, zero, six. Eight, five, seven, six, seven. Number sign, send. Zo got it again. <laughs> Congratulations, Zo. Over to you to read. Okay. All right. All right. That was good. It it takes um our how quick we can move to get our our numbers in. Uh I want to say thank you so very much, and I really want to give God thanks for tonight. We were able to get information from two professionals and we had a powerful testimony. I want to really thank everybody who took time out to be on. Thank you, Sister Alicia, our host, and thank you, Sister Raven. Thanks to everybody who came on and made this night another night. Uh, in my mind, that was a, a success. I trust that you know, we will just continue and that this forum will really be helpful, will, will really be, you know, very helpful to persons who come on. And as Sister Cole, Evangelist Cole said in her prayers, you know, we're trusting that this forum will reach persons far and wide. It will raise a consciousness in our health. It will raise consciousness in what God really desires. He says he, it is this desire that we prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper. We want to give God thanks for tonight, ladies uh, and gentlemen. We look forward to another forum from the last Monday in the month of February where another professional will be coming on to give us tips on how as ladies we remain healthy. Remember, we are ordinary women in the hands of an extraordinary God. And because Amen. we can do extraordinary. No, no, we're not giving out for the doctor. 
uh, the, oh, the numbers. He had placed them in the chat, but if he doesn't, I am going to be getting, he's sending it to my niece, Kiva, and I will make sure that I send it on so that that person can access it. All right. Thank you so very much. Can we just pause a little again and we say, God, we thank you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for what you have done. Lord, we continue to lift you because you're an awesome God. And so, Lord, we just ask that you will just be with us tonight. Be our shelter, be our guide. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to shield us. Oh, God, from the plots of the enemy, you promise us, Lord, that you will be there for us and you will cover us under your almighty wings. We give you the praise tonight, Lord. We thank you for the presenters. We pray that you'll continue to bless them. We thank you for those who took time off to be on this forum tonight. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless your people and allow us, Lord God, to lean on you. Because, God, when we lean on you, God, and when we trust in you, you said, Lord, that we shall be like Mount Zion and we shall not be moved. We thank you for your protective edge around us tonight. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everybody. God bless you. And we look forward to another informative forum on the last Monday in February. Blessings. God bless you. Good night, ladies. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, ladies. Good night, everyone. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Not to worry. Never got no, I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days. <laughs> I've been held in your head From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see <laughs> The goodness of God Give you